Hey everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from Slovenia, uh, but I spent all winters in Canary Islands. Um, and instead of fixing preventable bugs, I prefer to be on a beach like this. Um, so I've developed over the years uh, an ability or uh, tools that, uh, find, that help me find preventable bugs in our code or in our processes. And this is what I'm gonna share today, just a few of those. Uh, since we only have 25 minutes, I cannot really go deep into any of them, so, but, uh, so I'm just going to uh, introduce like, in, uh, some seeds so that you can uh, later on research on your own. Um, so before we begin, who here has pushed code uh, to production or to master or to, to GitHub uh, in a hurry? Yeah, right? Angry? Tired? under the influence, <laughs> right? Uh, we, we like to think that we're like, we're disciplined people, we're engineers, we're like machines, but we do make mistakes. And oftentimes when we, have, when we make mistakes, uh, we say like it's human error, but usually it's actually the process uh, that, that is the problem, not, not the human. Uh, also, uh, our, our profession is very young. Uh, we, the, so software engineering has only been in existence for like, what, 60 years maybe? and there's more than 20 million software developers. Uh, any idea how we get from zero to 20 million in a span of 60 years? You have to double every few years. Uh, so, you know, there are now twice as many software developers than there were, let's say, three years ago. Uh, that means that, by definition, half of our community is inexperienced, and we cannot rely on them being disciplined, experienced developers because they just didn't have the time. Or maybe if you say that someone needs five years to be experienced, it's actually three quarters of our community. Um, so yeah, let's not rely on discipline. Um, ten years ago, I started working on an open source project. We were building an API for a, a Python CMS call, called Plone. And back then, I instead like I put in place policy that we're going to document all our methods uh, in this way. This was way before typing existed. Existed, and we said like every every function needs to every API function needs to have a documentation of what it returns, right? And the, the project has been super successful. I haven't touched it in, I don't know, seven, eight years. It's been merged into Plone Core, and every Plone installation has it these days. Uh, but still, I found one function in there today that still doesn't have that. Document the, the, the doesn't document the, the return value. Uh, and so there has been more than 60 contributors to this project. They're all experienced, and it's been 10 years, and nobody noticed it. So, so to hell with discipline. Even though we said we're going to be disciplined, we're going to document all the, all the functions, we didn't. Um, when I started my developing career, there was the, the, the jury was still out whether testing is actually good or not. You know, you can, re, you can go online and read these old posts of people fighting, you know, is unit testing still, you know, makes sense? Yeah, but people say, yeah, we don't use tests because they kill agility, they slow us down. And, Nah, you don't need to write tests. And you know, ten years later, every like who used who writes tests? Yeah, everybody, of course. <laughs> uh, we kind of learn as a community that tests actually make us faster. I mean, sure, when you're writing something from scratch, it's it takes more time because you need to write the test as well. But you, we're not writing things from scratch most of the time. Most of the time, we're touching old code, we're fixing bugs, we're re refactoring. When you have ta have tests, that is so much faster. And Here's my hypothesis. The types are the unit tests of the coming decade. Uh, some people use it, some don't. Some people think they're, they're helpful. Some are like, yeah, maybe, but not in all cases. Some are like, yeah, it's just extra work. It doesn't really uh, bring any, any, any benefit. But, but I believe that, not in the sense that types are going to replace unit tests, but in 10 years, we're all going to be, uh, of course, we're, we're using types next to unit tests, because types just catch. Uh, a different class of, of problems than the new tests do. So, uh, who here is using MyPy regularly? So I know how fast I go through this example. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go semi-fast. Uh, the code is online. Uh, we're building an Ancestry app, something like 23andMe, and we're a startup, so we need to ship. Um, so this is our data model. We have a person that has a name and a, f and a mother and a, and a, and a father. And now we need, uh, we need an imaginary f f uh, family uh, where, where it's super important, like the ancestry is super important, the family tree is, tre family tree is really important. Does anyone have any idea who, who could we use? Something where it's super important who the father is? 
<laughs> so we modeled the Star Wars family tree with our, with our classes. Uh, we write tests because we're disciplined developers. Uh, and this is our code base. It's, it's one file, you can, you can get it online. I split it here so it fits into slides. Uh, and then we run tests. Yay, we're awesome, let's go to production. Uh, and then someone <laughs> gets Han's grandparents and poof. What happened, like we're, we wrote 100% tests, what, no, what's going on? Um, yeah, let's see if types help. So since Python 3.5 we've had a core uh, library called typing and we use that to, uh, to document the types of attributes and parameters in our Python code. It's similar to the documentation example I was sh showing you earlier. Um, and so this is how we do it. Uh, T.optional, so optional means that the mother can be a person or a nun. Um, and, and that's it, so we say mother can be, can be set or not, uh, father can be set or not, and that's it. Again, this is our entire code base. This, the, the yellow things are the changes that we've done. It's not a lot, a few characters. Uh, we run MyPy and we get this error. I'm just gonna show it here so it's in the same place. Uh, and it tells us that in, in this in these lines here, uh, we're doing self mother dot mother. So, and this can be a person object or it can be a none. So you, you're doing you know, none dot mother and none doesn't have any attributes and that's why uh, the code fails. Uh, so MyPy discovered this bug, hopefully before it was in production. In our case, we were already in production, but yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we fix our code to, to only append to grandparents if, if these person objects are set. Um, run the tests again, cool. Because we added a new test because we saw that there's something missing. Um, and now, some annoying user tries to get to get Kylo's grandparents. And I'm not sure if this bug is better or worse than the one before. You see there's two names and there's a none and a none. Uh, because the previous one blew up in your face and you noticed that this one could go unnoticed for quite some time. Um, so the typing library is not only for documenting uh, parameters and attributes, but also return values. Right, the same thing as I was showing you before in the, that uh, API documentation. It's just now it's in the code and it cannot get outdated. And what we're doing here is we're saying that uh, this method returns a list of persons, right? Because if, if I'm getting grandparents, I want to get person objects. That's the old change we did, nothing else. We run MyPy. And we get an error. Again, I'm going to copy it over. Uh, and we say we get incompatible return value type, right? So MyPy says that we told them that this function or method will only return a list of persons, but because this can be a person or a none, we're actually returning a list of either person or none objects, and this clashes with what we're saying that uh, we're returning. Uh, so we fix our code, we're, or, we're only appending a person if, if it's not a none. And add a test. And that's it. Uh, and then the time goes on, we had, we had to add the JSON, uh, JSON function, you can see it here. Uh, but now before I actually, before I push to production and again we get user facing bugs, let's see if we can stop relying on us being very experienced and, experienced and disciplined developers and, and figuring out where type annotations are missing, let's ask MyPy, hey, is there something else that I should annotate? And you can, that, you can do that by, do, by calling MyPy with strict. Get a bunch of errors or warnings and that's the final result. Um, as you can see, like we went from completely no documentation for the code. We actually went for to completely documented code. All the values in the in your code are documented and this is always up to date. It's not like it's in a doc string and it's gonna get uh, outdated when someone forgets to update it. Um, MyPy, big thumbs up, use it. Um, and the mess is 
you know, far bigger than just maybe some docs. Uh, there's, I found a paper that, that claims that uh, about one in five genetic research papers are completely invalid because Excel converted uh, gene names into dates. It's like imagine the amount of money and research money and time spent on a stupid typing conversion mistake. Ugh. And yeah, there's, there's a talk by Airbnb and they claim that 38% of their bugs, production bugs, could have been fixed by typing. Mm. So this was the original title of my talk, documentation is bad, okay? Um, but I was sure that I was not gonna get accepted at all. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to convince you today is to not write documentation, right? You write documentation as the last resort. Like when you're trying to fix a, pro like a, a process or a process error or a human error, don't write a policy document. You should always do this and this and that, and then you should do this and this and that, and then everything's gonna be peachy because it won't be people who forget. So try to write code or use the uh, tooling to, uh, to enforce that process. And at this point, is there more documentation? We just deleted documentation in doc strings, right, about the, the, the types in your code, because that's now completely covered by MyPy and tooling, and it's up to date, and it's tested. Is there more documentation that we can delete? I'm really annoyed when I see documentation like this. Uh, coverage is a very popular Python uh, library, and before you can install it, you need to install some system-wide things, and in Ubuntu, you can do it like this, and if you have yum, you do it like this, but what if you're a Mac? If you're a Mac, good news. If you're on, if you're on Windows, good luck. Uh, so we're always we're always preaching as experienced developers to juniors. You need to pin your dependencies. You have to have a log file. But where is that pinned? It's not. It's just, it's not there's no versions there. Just like there's no hashes. Um, and it gets worse out when you get when you have more technologies in your project. Uh, I was organizing a big Python conference in Ljubljana a few years back. It was supposed to happen in April 2020. Uh, imagine how that went. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a few months we started, we restarted thinking about like we should, maybe we should, we're, we're not ready to do it, try doing it again. Um, and I just wanted to update the website. And I opened up the repository for the website. I scrolled down to the installation documentation, which I think should be removed. Um, and there it was, the list of things I need to install, and I just went, whoa, <laughs> there goes my afternoon. Um, and you know, people mentioned a a ASDF, a tool that installs your, your, your different languages, and that comes close, but ASDF doesn't know how to install Jekyll, so I will need to figure that one out. And if this wouldn't be a simple website, but maybe something that has some scientific data, some scientific tooling, then there's a lot of C stuff to install globally, and it just becomes a, a total time waste. Um, but, as you can see, let's see, you can see. <laughs> I don't have Ruby installed on my machine, I don't have Jekyll, I don't have Node on my machine, but when I go into dragonpy.com, the website project, magic happens. Uh, I'm using Nix. Nix is a language agnostic package manager. It's fully deterministic. Once it's built, it builds something, it's always gonna build the same thing. Um, and it goes beyond the languages. Here it's gonna install the Ruby stuff, the, the Node stuff, all the, it actually looks inside your projects and find packages.json uh, file for, for Node packages, installs them, it files a uh, game lock or whatever the Ruby thing is, is. Um, and just prepares everything and wraps it nicely into your, into your shell, so you, you're there, uh, you have it there when you're working on a project, and then when you exit the folder, it's gone so it doesn't pollute your other uh, projects. There we are, so we're installing Node, no, no dependencies, almost there, and we're done. And now I can run Jekyll and get the website up. Um, so I can go from a completely blank machine that has Nix installed, so this is the, the thing you have to do, you have to install Nix, the package manager, and then you enter a project that you haven't worked for years, just enter them, wait for Nix to do its thing, and you're up and running. And this whole thing is described by this much of this much code. It's not, you know, some lines and lines of codes, it's just basically up there you're giving you're giving it a a link to a specific commit of Nix packages. I'll come back to that later. So it's frozen in time, it's not gonna change in the future. 
and then under build inputs, you tell it uh, what tooling do you need. And because we're using Gulp, uh, it knows it needs to pull in stuff from package JSON, and because we're using Jekyll, it also knows that it needs to install the dependencies from the game, game file lock. Mm, Nix is not a new thing, it's been, it's been around for 20 years. Uh, it's based on a PhD uh, of PhD on how to do the, how to build deterministic Linux systems. So it has strong theoretical uh, foundations, uh, and it has a huge community. Um, like these days, for, for in the last couple of years since I've been using Nix, uh, it only happened to me once that one package was not included in Nix packages. Nix packages is a collection of Nix files that describe how different software is built with Nix. And as you can see, the popularity is still uh, going up, even though it's a 20-year-old uh, project. Mm. I was telling you before that it gets more complicated when, when we get to um, more you know, complex stuff. And this is, if you want to install Porutils, which is a, a, a sequencing uh, tooling that genetic scientists use, you have to go through all these steps, and I don't even know where to begin. It's, because you need a special science type of homebrew, not just the regular homebrew, and then you need HDF5, which, no idea. Site and, and NumPy are always fun to install, and then at the end there's something about R and s getting automatic installation from CRAN website, yeah, I don't know what that is. And finally at the end you see like that this documentation was written for Snow Leopard and Mavericks, and that's ages ago, like, does this work? Probably not, I don't know. Um, and, you know, people just don't update it because they don't know it's broken. And this is how you do that with Nix. Uh, this, this is a screenshot from Nix packages, the big Nix, Nix uh, repository of Nix uh, definitions. And, you know, there's a name and a version. And then where to get the source, it's from GitHub. Nix always includes SHAs, uh, hashes of everything that it downloads so that when it downloads it again in the future, it can compare the hashes so nothing changed. And then here there's the the list, the actual list of dependencies, the whole web, like the whole page of dependencies is listed here. And it's completely frozen in time. Because all the other packages in Nix packages have you know, versions defined. So if you take exactly this commit of Nix packages and use it in your uh, Nix file, like this is exactly what you're gonna get. Um, I've transitioned my company, so we are nine people, 15 year old company. After this, we've transitioned to from using Ansible and Homebrew and PyEnv to, to Nix in the last two to three years, and there's a whole class of problems that I don't have anymore. Um, it's it's amazing how much more time I have these days um, because yeah, this don't happen anymore. Like I used to, I used to have to because I work on many projects, old projects, and different languages, different stacks. About every once in three months, I would have to just like, yeah, this is completely broken. R remove everything, reinstall everything from scratch because just there's something somewhere that's polluting some other project. And yeah, with Nix, that doesn't happen because it's completely separated. Um, if that piqued your interest, I wrote a blog post on how to go beyond requirements TXT using Nix. And let's move on. So. So we removed documentation for you know, some code documentation, we removed installation documentation. There's another document that a lot of companies and teams have, which is a security policy. Everybody on our team should have disk encryption. Everybody on our team should, uh, their screen should lock after 20 minutes of inactivity. And we had this as well. Um, but then um, I realized that, you know, I really care about security, I have all of this, but does everybody on my team have it? I don't know. Um, and there are tools to enforce these things, but then basically you need to you need to get root access to all the machines, and not everybody you know is would likely give you or give someone the root access to their machine. So we needed something super light, read only. Uh, so we actually created it for ourselves. This is Pareto Security, our newest project. It's if if you use a Mac, you should really try it out. Uh, it lives in your menu bar and just checks that you have the basic security features enabled. So Mac. Mac OS actually comes with a bunch of really nice security features, but for one reason or another, people have them disabled. And this reminds you to enable them, please. Um, and then you can also set it up in a way where it sends this information, just the, like nothing, no tracking, no anything, just the, the list of failing checks and the list of passing checks, it sends to a web dashboard, so you as a 
uh, you know, team lead can see that everybody on the team has uh, passing checks and you can be, you can sleep well. So yeah, predatorsecurity.com and use Spike on IT for 30% off. It's only valid for a week, so make sure you do it fast. Uh, right. Another class of, of, of problems that uh, usually have been documented and can now not be documented anymore is, is how to sync backend and, and frontend. Um, there's, you know, there's this API specification called Open API. I made a big uh, long talk about it uh, a few years back in Ferrara, not, not, not far from here, so I'm not gonna bore you with that one, but I'm gonna show you what it enables us. Um, it enables us to because now we have the, our, our API, so the thing that backend and frontend communicate through is defined by a single YAML file. And then we can take a code generator that reads this YAML file and generates frontend code, right? But then we had in our document, in, in the frontend documentation for developers that whenever you change the API specification YAML file, remember to also rerun the code generation. And of course, someone forgot. So what we did was we added a, a new step in our CI, which does the generation and then checks if there are any changes. So anytime you do any code generation, uh, do, it, do it also in your, in your CI and then check if there are any changes. Like if, you, if you're in Circle CI, there's an orb to do that. But if, if you're using some other CI, it's, it's a simple you know, git diff, basically. If git diff is empty, all good. If it's not, someone forgot to commit something. Uh, one last anecdote. Uh, Alembic is a migration like helper for people that use SQL Alchemy. And for reasons that are not really relevant, you shouldn't use ORM bindings or ORM, ORM calls in migration scripts. And we had, we had this happen to us, we had a number of nasty bugs, and then we had an internal presentation by one of our senior developers explaining why you shouldn't do that. Um, and then we're like, great, we're gonna make a blog post about it, we're gonna put it into our onboarding documentation so everybody in the company knows not to do that. And then we're like, yeah, maybe just make a check for it, because you know, that's, that's how we make sure we really don't do it again. So I'm just reiterating this point over and over again. Whenever you, you, you start adding policy and processes, like, can you add code to just prevent that altogether? And actually, no, one more. <laughs> also, also with Alembic. Um, so it happened to us, even though we have robust PR review process, that somehow we, got, we pushed code to production that was missing a, a database migration. So what we do now is, again, in CI, we actually create a new database migration with Alembic and then check if it's empty. If it's not, somebody forgot to commit something. And just, you know, this whole class of problems Alembic created problems just disappeared. They, they, don't, they do not appear anymore. Um, and that was my talk. Something needs documenting, write code instead. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have eight minutes for question answering. So I will start with the first one. So what about documentation for installing an IX? Nix? <laughs> uh, so installing Nix is what happens like once, and there's official documentation for that. You don't need to write that. So you install Nix, you go to, uh, I forgot what the domain is, but nixos.org, I guess. Yeah, nixos.org, and there are ins there's instructions how to install it on various operating systems. Yeah, I should have moderated the, the, the question first. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so do you, know an, uh, do you know of any performance impacts of typing? Okay. Uh, so performance impacts of typing uh, during development time, I, I find that for, 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 our, for our use, the types are about 10 times faster than running tests, so I have, don't worry about them. Uh, in terms of in production, as far as I know, types are ignored uh, during runtime by, by C Python, so there's no impact there. It's like if you do have comments in your code, they're just ignored. Would you suggest building all Docker images for production usage, usage using Nix, pros and cons, or it is mostly for local development? Uh, so we do, uh, that, that's, the, that's a great point about Nix, because you have a single I mean, you can split in different files, but you, 
basically have a single source of truth for, for all your dependencies. Uh, production dependencies, development dependencies, shared dependencies, maybe dependencies for staging, and it's all described with Nix. And then you can, in, in, in your local environment, you say this is a local environment, so I need development dependencies. And you can say, well, now I'm building a doc production Docker image, just take the production uh, dependencies. And the benefit that Nix has here is that uh, Nix actually d uh, discriminates between build time dependencies and then runtime dependencies. So for example, even if you need GCC to compile your production uh, dependency, Nix will know that you don't need GCC uh, as in, uh, to run those dependencies. So the result will actually be very small, much smaller than the traditional approaches. So yeah, definitely do it. So why should I use Nix instead of Docker Compose? And I suppose, I mean, also Docker in this case. Yeah, I, I had a slide, but I wasn't sure if, if yeah. it's gonna fit, so <laughs> I, I can address it now. Yeah, um, do it, please, we have time. Yeah, have five minutes. so Docker gets quite close. The problem with Docker is that um, Docker images are not really, uh, they're still mutable. Even though you think they're not mutable, they are mutable. Sometimes it changes, and it, it, it has happened to us where we used an official Ubuntu um, Docker image or Python image, and we were using some uh, machine learning stuff, and all of a sudden the results were different. And like, not, nothing, like I went through the logs, nothing changed, it's exactly the same code. And then we found that Ubuntu issued a security bug that patched some C library, and that actually changed the output of our, of our model. It was insane. Um, the other problem with Docker is, uh, it's a full virtual machine, so you need to do security for, for that. And I mean, not full virtual machine. It's a container. It has it has networks. So there are some security implications for for that. But uh, like I said, we do use Docker in production, but we just build a Docker image with Nix. So Docker and, and Nix do work together. In terms of development, I really like to use my own shell, and I like to my laptop not to be overheating, and so you know, running a Docker next to on a local machine, yeah, it's, it's it works, but you know, it's not ideal, at least uh, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, Docker uses the, the processes. And yeah, yeah. And uh, let me moderate any new, okay. Pareto sec is just for Mac? Yes, just for Mac. No. Yeah, I, I mean, you can convince me to support Linux as well. <laughs> Windows, uh, I don't know. Hmm. No, <laughs> no. Nah. If there's some cash commitment, then yeah. <laughs> For Linux, I just need a couple of, you know, just requests. <laughs> um, okay, let me read it first. Are there any checks you wish you had, but it's too hard to automate, so you still have policies? Or is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are. Um, uh, I mean, we're adding more and more because we started with 100, so we, we have been requiring 100% test coverage since 2014. Um, and then we, at some point a few years back, we kind of added 100% types coverage, but that doesn't really work well. Um, so there's, there's, we, there's lots of stuff that still needs to happen in the, in the typing space to be able to really, really have like a, a CI step that would fail if, if not all types are present, especially when you're dealing with dependencies and you have like um, maybe a web framework that has 50 dependencies and not all are typed, then it's kind of, uh, yeah, you can't really cover everything. So, but the Python as a community is moving towards that. So um, I'm hoping in a few years it get in a few years it gets better. Okay. Um, yeah. And is testing with MyPy considered enough or you need other type, type validation with other software, e example, uh, PyWrite? I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, I use, I've only used MyPy so far. Um, if someone has opinions is that it's not enough and PyWrite should be used as well, please speak up, because I'm interested in that, or find me later. So questions from the app, they are over, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. do you, mm, you showed the MyPy strict uh, argument. Mm -hmm. and, uh, do you use it like as a pre-check for like, like for like for simple projects you can use it, but like I said, if you have a big project with lots of dependencies, then it kind of reports too much stuff. So you have to use certain flags to limit uh, how many you know warnings it it produces. Because ideally you want it, ideally you want it to configure in a way where there are no warnings, and you 
you make this like a baseline in your in your CI, and then over time you you uh, remove some of those ignores out, and then there's you know, but you still had ha still get the same you know zero warnings because zero warnings prevents you from introducing warnings uh, into into the system. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not ideal there. We're, we're, we're moving there. Okay. We have one minute. Okay. Yeah. On the subject of what you asked, a uh, really, really simple, stupid thing you can do is like you basically line count the errors and just ensure that the number doesn't increase with time. Yeah. Uh, I was searching for Nix before you said it's only for Mac. And I found Nix OS, Linux support, it's different stuff. Uh, the, the question was Pareto security if it's only for Mac. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. but Nix runs on everything, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, hmm? my fault. <laughs> I haven't tried on Windows. I'm sure someone has. <laughs> so we are on time, and thank you very much. <laughs>